began last week. Um, three lost things. We're going to talk about the sheep and the coin today. And so I have some, uh, I have some sermon aids here this morning. I'm going to put this down here. Don't get too excited. I'm going to drop some money around here. Here we go. We'll get to that later this morning. Don't come running up yet because all of this money is borrowed money. <laughs> I think only one dollar of it is mine, so that's a little bit later this morning. We want to talk this morning about three lost things, the sheep and the coin. We began talking about this just a little bit last week, but we come to it in more detail now. And this is from the 15th chapter of Luke. As I was doing more study uh, yesterday in preparation for today, um, it was interesting to me as I was reading various commentators that many, many commentators believe they consider Luke chapter 15 one of the great chapters of the Bible, along, along with some others, John 3 um, and uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 11 and some others as well, some of the, one of the great chapters in the Bible as it talks about the love of God, the love of the Father, the Father's love for what is lost. And um, so as I was preparing yesterday and um, trying to balance, because last week, those of you who were here in the second service, you heard a very, very different message from what I spoke in the first service. Really, it was like two different messages, and the Lord does that sometimes. And, and um, so I was trying to balance last week, first service, second service, with this week as well. So if you were in the second service last week, we're coming to this fresh. If you were in the first service, you've heard some of this already, if you are in the first service last week. But um, we come into to Luke 15, and he talks about three lost. Jesus tells parables um, about three lost things. We don't tell parables very much these days, do we? Usually it's fairly direct. But in the time of Jesus, parables were very commonly used to teach truth. And it means to, to you've often heard uh, the definition of a parable as what? A, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's a fairly common, a simple, uh, that's a simple uh, um, definition of a parable. But the idea also means to set alongside something else. So here you have the earthly story and then set alongside it is, is the heavenly or the deeper truth that goes with it. So we come into this chapter of Luke 15 that has three parables, in a way almost one big parable because all three of them really talk about the same thing. But this story, this chapter begins, um, to me interestingly, not with parables, it begins in, a, in another way. Um, and it begins with some very strong verses. And let's look at Luke uh, 15, 1 and 2. And uh, as we look at 15, 1 and 2, this is from the New King James Version. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And if I were you, and I were reading this chapter, you know what I would do? I would probably say, why? Okay, because this particular translation says, then all of them drew near. Why? You know, sometimes we read the Bible, we don't pay a lot of attention, do we? We just kind of, choo -choo 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 -choo, and we, because it's familiar to us. And we miss a lot of the wonderful things that are in the Bible. But chapter 15 begins, and then they all drew near to him to hear him. And I wonder why that is. Because these people, the tax collectors and the sinners, now we say, yes, I'm a sinner too. But in those days, if you said sinner, it meant somebody who was really bad, really bad. And tax collectors, even worse. Who's the worst person you know? You may know an individual or you may say a certain type of person. This is the worst type of person. We could, we could name all sorts of people, couldn't we? Or all sorts of things that people do and we'd say, that's a bad person. Well, in those days, if they called somebody, if somebody was a tax collector, that was basically saying it's the lowest of the low, the worst of the worst. So I have a question. Why would this chapter begin with the worst of the worst drawing near to the best of the best, right? Really, the worst of the worst, drawing near to the best of the best. Because you know what, brothers and sisters? That doesn't happen today very much, does it? The worst of the worst stay far away from the best of the best. And the best of the best, in earthly terms, we, we tend to stay far away from the worst of the worst, don't we? Those of us that say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not like that. And yet we see this chapter beginning with really bad 
people, you understand what, what I'm saying when I say bad, really bad people, wanting to be near the one who was the holiest of all, who was perfect, who had never sinned, who was the Son of God, who was the best of the best, and they wanted to be near him. And there's only one explanation for that. There's only one. There's no, there's no other explanation for it. And that is that he loved them, that there was love. That was the only explanation. Nothing else, nothing else would have drawn the worst of the worst to the best of the best. And do you know what? It's still the same today. It will be love that draws people. It will be love. It will not even be, although God uses truth, and God uses preaching and teaching. He does use those things. But still, it is love that draws people. It's love that draws people. And so they draw near to Jesus to hear him teach. If they drew near him to hear him teach, do you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking that Jesus probably didn't say, You are so bad. You are so sinful. You are so, you're such a terrible person. I doubt that's what Jesus was saying, was saying. And when we read the New Testament, that wasn't what he was saying. Jesus cared about sin, and he knew why he had come, but that's not how he approached people. And he approached people in love, in love. And that's how we're going to reach people as well, in love. That's the only way. And so they draw near. But this upset some people, and chapter 15 begins with an accusation. Look at the accusation. Have you ever been accused of something, true or false? Have you ever been accused? How did it make you feel? <laughs> I don't know about you, but often when I'm accused, I want to fight. You say, Pastor, I do. And so do you, most of the time. When we're accused, we want to defend ourselves, don't we? We fight back. Well, you this. Well, you that. But we see this, this accusation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, look at this, he receives sinners. And by the way, this man, this is one translation. Another translation actually is much more disrespectful of, their, of how, what they said. Do you know what they really say? They're talking about Jesus and they say, this fellow, that's, that's what it means. Can you imagine that? This tells you what they thought of Jesus, right? Isn't that interesting? The so-called religious and good people of the day accused Jesus, and the so-called worst people of the day drew near to hear him teach. So we see this, this dichotomy, this strange, this, this strange, this black and white, if you will. And so they accuse him and they say, he receives sinners, he even, even worse, he eats with them. It's, it's far worse to eat because that means I identify with you when you're seated at a table. And that's still true in many cultures today. And the accusation that they made was in fact true. It was true. Jesus did indeed, re did indeed receive sinners. Jesus did indeed eat with them. Just as he has with you and with me as well. He's done the same thing for us. So it begins with an accusation. And Jesus, being God, doesn't fight back, but instead he turns it around and he tells a story. And he tells parables. Parables were very common in that day. And that was the way of teaching that the Hebrews, that the Jews would use and many others. Very f seldom would they stand in the pulpit and preach as I'm preaching. It would usually be in a parable form. And that's how Jesus taught. And he starts with the, sh the lost sheep then the lost coin, and then the lost son. And so let's look at the first story of the sheep um, that, that is lost. So here we have it in Luke 15, 4 through 7. We know this so well, don't we? Is there anyone who doesn't know this story? If, 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 if not, we don't want to say so, right? Because this is so well known. We know this story. And this is the story of a shepherd who has a flock of 100 sheep, and he discovers that one is missing and he has 99 sheep left and he leaves the 99 and he goes out searching for the one and when he finds him he brings him back and rejoices that he has found the sheep that was lost and then Jesus makes the point that he wants to make so there's the basic story it's about a shepherd and I like this because you know what this first story is a story for the men 
and the boys. This wasn't a story for the women very much. And there would have been men and women in this crowd. But this is a man's story because men were shepherd. Boys were shepherds. David was a shepherd. Uh, Joseph's brothers were shepherds. But no little girl grew up saying, I want to be a shepherd when I grow up. No little girl said that, but maybe little boys did. This is a story for the men and the boys. The next story is different. And Jesus was speaking in a way to touch everybody. And so he tells this story. They all would understand it because it was an agrarian society and there would have been many, many, there very probably were shepherds in the, in the group and shepherds and sheep were a common part of the landscape of that time. And so a flock of 100 sheep was, do you think that's a lot or a little? Was that, would that have been a rich shepherd? Average. To me it sounds pretty rich, right? If you say a hundred sheep, in some, that seems like, seems like pretty rich. But in that day, a hundred sheep would have been apparently, uh, I'm not that wise about sheep and shepherds, I was doing research. And so um, a, a, hundred, a, sh a flock of 100 sheep would be an average size flock. So one is missing and the shepherd goes to look. Now we already know the point of this story and we see it here, but I want us to think about it because this is a story that we know so very well. We're so familiar with it and I want, to, I want us to think about it and talk about it for just a little bit. This was not uncommon, by the way, because as we've said before, sheep, smart or dumb? Dumb. Sheep can find their way home like a dog or a cat that's lost and can... No, cannot. If a sheep gets lost, they stay lost unless somebody comes to find them. Did you know that? True. Yes. If a sheep gets lost, they stay lost unless somebody finds them. I was reading a little bit more about it. Sheep, if they are in an enclosure at times, and if, for example, the enclosure catches fire, they will often panic. They're not even smart enough to run out. They just burn up. They're not smart animals. They're not smart animals. And so here's this sheep, and it was not uncommon for a sheep to stray and to get lost. And so it was the shepherd's responsibility, it was the shepherd's work when a sheep got lost to go and look for the sheep. And so we have this picture here that they would have understood. When would a shepherd count the sheep? When would a shepherd know, I've got one missing? I mean, let me ask you this. A hundred sheep, how do you know when one is missing? Because sheep kind of look alike, don't they? They, all, they look pretty much alike. I mean, some may be a little bit brown here. Some, one may have a little horn or something like that. But pretty much a hundred sheep, they, sheep look like sheep. But they, they do. So what would happen would be usually in the evening as the shepherd gathered the sheep from grazing and sheep generally love to be in higher elevations and they would graze and then the shepherd would gather them he would bring them back and bring them into the sheepfold or, or a, a temporary enclosure. And then in the evening, the, she the shepherd would count the sheep. He would count, how many sheep do I have? And he would go through and he would count each one. And it would have been in those circumstances that the shepherd would have discovered, one of my sheep is missing. One of my sheep is missing. What are you going to do when a sheep is missing? Let me ask you about it. Think about it. Now, we're all so spiritual, so all of us will say, I will go look for my sheep, right? <laughs> because we know the Bible story. But I want us to be practical. It's nighttime. It's been a long day. It's been hard work. The shepherd is tired. It's dark. If the sheep is lost, he's not lost nearby. He's lost somewhere pretty far away. He may be down a ravine, he may be caught somewhere, but he's far enough away that the shepherd did not hear the sheep bleeding for help or baaing for help or whatever. It has to be somewhere pretty far away. And there were no electric lights and there were no, uh, uh, what are those things called? Flashlights or torches, if you are British, right? To look for the, to look for the sheep. It would have been maybe a, a, little, a, a little oil lamp or something like that. It would have been difficult and hard work to find the sheep. Let me ask you, those of you who are business people, a hundred sheep, one goes missing. Mm, one percent loss. That's not too bad, is it? So, no, seriously. Yeah. Steve, you're a businessman. One percent, how's that? You can tolerate it, right? Not bad, huh? hundred percent. Eve, you're a businesswoman. One percent? I'm tall. Yeah, not bad. Why doesn't the shepherd 
cut his losses and say, never mind, it doesn't matter, it's just one sheep. I've got 99 more. Why doesn't he do that? And when Jesus tells this story, he wants us to understand the heart of the Father and the love of the Father. So I just want us to look, up, look at it. I, I don't want to be so, so spiritual. I really want to be really practical about it as we look at it. Why does the sheep, he has the 99, go looking for the one that's missing? As I was thinking about this yesterday, I thought about my mother. And here's another earthly example. If you will, this is another parable for you um, that helps you, that helps you, helps me anyhow, look at this and understand it a little bit more. Those of you, some of you know my mother fairly well. I know her very well. And when my mother's eyesight was better, it's not very good anymore, but when my mother's eyesight was better, even here in Hong Kong, do you know what she used to do? Her favorite pastime? Now, Dad liked to go out and walk. He loved to walk. He would walk everywhere up on the, mount, the hills around Taipo, and sometimes Mom would go with him, but she didn't really love walking. Dad would go walking. Mom loved, when she wasn't cooking or cleaning and she had free time, she would sit down in her chair, and she'd put a big sort of a board or something flat on her lap. And do you know what Mom would do? She would put together jigsaw puzzles. How many of you like to do jigsaw puzzles? You know, Beth like, okay, Gwen, Alistair's going, <laughs> I think it just depends on the type of person you are. My dad, he'd rather shoot himself in the foot than do a jigsaw puzzle. But mom loved it. And mom, those of you that are jigsaw puzzle people, you know what a jigsaw puzzle is? Yeah, yeah. we know, okay. Um, I don't even know what the word is in Chinese or French, but anyhow, a jigsaw puzzle. And for mom, because she loved jigsaw puzzles, guess what? She didn't want a 300-piece jigsaw puzzle. No. Beth, what size do you want? One or 2,000. One or 2,000. How about you, Gwen? Under 1,000, says Gwen. Okay. Mom's favorite was around 1,000 pieces. 1,000 pieces? Or sometimes 1,500 pieces. And Mom would put it together. It would take her weeks to put it together. And she'd just take a little bit of time. She'd work for half an hour. And then she'd put it down. Then she'd come back later. She loved to do that. But as I was thinking about it, and I feel like the Holy Spirit brought it to mind yesterday, I remember my mom doing the puzzle. And she would put it together. She would put it together. And she always took very good care of her jigsaw puzzles. You know, Hong Kong doesn't have a lot of room. But in their little village house on the top shelf, mom had one shelf. It was all hers. And it was all jigsaw puzzles. And we, she gave those all away when she left. And she would take one down and she'd put it together. And then when she'd come to the end, maybe there'd be one or two pieces left. One or two pieces left. Here's this 1,000 or 1,500 piece puzzle. And she said the most satisfying thing was to take that last piece, that last piece, and that's where it goes and she would put it in right where it went. Nothing more satisfying because that meant it's complete. You see where I'm going with this, don't you? There was a place for every piece. Every piece would fit. There was nothing worse than having a puzzle and mom would put it together and she'd reach the end and you know what's gonna happen next, don't you? Maybe somebody else had borrowed it. Maybe somebody else wasn't as careful and she'd reach the end, and there would be one piece missing. But she has 999 pieces. Isn't that good enough? 999 pieces, isn't that good enough? No, why not? If you've got 999 pieces, why isn't one missing piece, why isn't that good enough? Why does one missing piece matter? Why does it count? You tell me. It's incomplete. Something's missing. 999, Gwen, would that be enough for you? No. Why? It's not complete. Something's missing. And here's this beautiful picture. Does that make sense to you this morning? When we look at this, the story of the shepherd, he's got 99 sheep. Isn't that enough? No. Why? It's not complete. There's something missing. There's something lacking. And Jesus says, that's how it is with the Father and the joy He feels when what is lost is found and it's brought back to its rightful place. And when that lost piece, when that lost sheep is found and brought back, the flock is not incomplete anymore. Everything fits where it's supposed to fit. And that's a picture 
of the Father's love and care for the lost, for each one of us, for each one of us. It's the same way. It's the same picture. It's the same idea. There's a part that's missing. And if it's missing, it doesn't matter that you've got 999 pieces. It doesn't matter that you've got 99 sheep. Do those sheep matter? Yes, of course they do. Do those pieces matter? Of course they do. But the missing piece matters as well. The missing piece counts as well. And Jesus says, that's like the love of the Father. That's like, he says, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and who haven't strayed away. Now Jesus was talking to scribes and Pharisees who were judging him and condemning him, but he wanted them to understand this is the heart and the love of the Father. And, uh, and brothers and sisters, I think sometimes this is for you and for me as well. We need this as well. And so here's the story he tells. And I want you to see one other thing. He carries it over at home on his shoulders. And how does he carry it? Joyfully. Unlike you and me. What do we do sometimes? I told you so. You deserved it. You shouldn't have strayed away. Why did you whatever? That's not how God treats sinners. Instead, he gathers them up close and he joyfully brings them home. He joyfully, joyfully restores them to the place where they belong. That is how the Lord deals with you and with me. Now, is there correction for disobedience? Yes. Is there discipline for, for rebellion and for things like that? Yes. Yes. But it's always in love and the Father is always always joyful when what is lost is found. The Father is always joyful when what has been rebellious submits to the Father. The Father is always joyful when the child who is a Christian has gone his own way and comes back again. The Father is always joyful and he rejoices. Now I want us to look at one other thing here this morning. When he gets back home, what does he do? He calls his friends and his neighbors and he says, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. Now, guess what? When a sheep was lost and then was found, they did not have a party for the lost sheep. By the way, that wasn't done. They didn't have a party for the lost sheep. But Jesus was making a point here. Jesus was making a point and I want us to see the point as well. Because if he had a party for the lost sheep, this is what he would have done. He calls friends and neighbors. If you're going to have a rejoicing party for a lost sheep, what are you going to do? If it's really going to be a party... <laughs> Melrose said, kill another sheep. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> honestly, brothers and sisters, in that culture, in that society, yes or no, a mark of celebration would be to slaughter an animal for celebration. Yes or no? Yes. 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 Now some of us in the first service said, yeah, kill that sheep, right? <laughs> because that sheep was rebellious, because that sheep didn't listen to the voice of the master, and we laughed about it, but here's a great point for us, because you know what? That's not how the father sees it at all, is it? The father brings the sheep back, the shepherd brings the sheep back very, very joyfully, and he says, let's have a party. Let's have a party. And I want us to see something else. The cost of the party would have been far greater than the value of the sheep in earthly terms. Yes or no? Yes. Understand something, brothers and sisters. This is how God sees you. And this is how God sees every lost person. We sometimes look at ourselves and we look at others. And the value is very, very low, isn't it? We look at people, or we look at ourselves if we've really messed up, and we feel that our value is very low. Don't worry, Pastor Renee's gonna go, gonna go stop the drilling. That's where he's going. But we, we look at ourselves, and we think, I'm not worth very much because I've really messed up my life. Do some of you look that way, and you've thought that way about your own life? Or maybe your parents have told you, you're not worth very much. I spoke in the first service about a, a, a person that Pastor Renee and I counseled many, many years ago, and this person grew up being told by their mother, they were told as a child, you are ugly. What parent would say that? You are unlovable. Nobody will ever love you. That's what that child heard growing up. 
Can you imagine how that in, impacted that person, the, her, her own her self-worth, her view of herself? And many of us struggle with things like this. Or even as adults, we are in a culture or society, perhaps because of our because of our background or our skin color or our economics, we are not highly valued. We are looked on perhaps as a nuisance in certain cultures or we're looked on as very low in certain cultures. That's true for many of us. That's true for many of us. This morning, if you are a mainlander in Hong Kong, mm, do, you know what many, do you know how many people view mainlanders in Hong Kong? Yes. If your skin is not the right color, do you know how many people may view you? And I'm not just talking about Hong Kong, I'm talking about any culture. Every culture looks at certain people, certain, certain classes, and, and they put people down. Brothers and sisters, understand something this morning. That is not how you are valued. That is not how you are valued by the Father. Now, we still got a little bit of time left. We're not going to get as far in this service as we did in the last service. But I want to ask you something. Why does the shepherd go after the sheep? One easy way would be to say, because it's his sheep. That's one answer. But I don't think that's the only answer. I've got some things to show you. I have here some lost and found from Lighthouse. <laughs> this is real lost and found, by the way, from the fourth floor. You said lost and found? Lighthouse has? Yes, fourth floor. So if you're missing something, go look. Huh. A little stainless steel thermos of some sort. Does anybody recognize this? Does it belong? It's probably some child's. I'm not sure. It's been up there how long, Ida? A while. A few months, right? A few months. Hmm. Has anybody looked for this? I haven't received any phone calls asking about a thermos. Got something else. I'm not making this up. This is true. Does this look familiar to anybody? Yes. It does? Yes. Oh! Colette, is this yours? Oh, now, shall I give it back to you? Later. <laughs> we have found the owner. The, you know what? The sheep found the shepherd. The, she the shepherd didn't find the sheep. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's, what's, that's, been a, Colette, that's been there a long time. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and one more thing. Oh, this Bible has been here for years. That's even more troubling, isn't it? My question is this. Why are those things lost? And why are they not yet found? I, 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 I don't count this one. Okay. <laughs> Let me put this one over on this side. Because it's now been found. Why haven't I received any frantic phone calls on Sunday night. Pastor Jennifer, I'm looking for my steel thermos. Have you seen it at church somewhere? Or my Bible? I must have my Bible. Why are these things still lost? Why? They didn't look for it? Good answer. They're replaceable. They don't care. Maybe they've given up looking. Maybe they're not valuable to the owner. It doesn't matter. Now think about all those answers just a minute. And then think about the good shepherd. I mean it. Think about the good shepherd. All the things that you just said. He never gives up looking. He never. You have given up on some people this morning, haven't you? You've almost given up. You think, you think it's too hard. He never gives up looking. He always cares. You are not replaceable to the Good Shepherd. There's only one of you, and another one won't do. It's you he's looking for. It's that person he's looking for. And these things, 
that to us, well, maybe there's not so much value. They're easily replaced. It doesn't matter a lot whether this is lost or found. It is not how the Heavenly Father sees people. He sees lost people just as he saw you and just as he sees you when you wander away and when you stray away. And he says, you are valuable to me and I will look for you until I find you. I will not replace you with another. I will not say, well, it's enough that I have 99 others that love me and serve me and follow after me and are obedient. He will look for the one who is disobedient and rebellious and who has strayed away. He never never, never gives up. Aren't you glad he never gives up? Aren't you glad he never, never, never gives up? This is the love of the Father. This is the love of the Father. And you are valuable to him. And every bad sheep out there, every black sheep out there, as we sometimes say, you know, the black sheep of the family. We often say that, don't we? Our families. We have a black sheep in the family. There is no sheep that is, we were all black to the Father. We were. Yes. We were. Because what does the Bible say? Every one of us has turned in on, on our own way. We've gone our own way. Every one of us has left the Father. And He sees all of us the same. He loves all of us the same. And brothers and sisters, He values, He values each one of you the same. Have you blown it? or had a terrible week, he values you as much as he values me. This is the love of the Father. And when he brings you back, he doesn't bring you back scolding and saying, I told you so, you knew you, you shouldn't have done it, but you did it anyhow. The Bible picture that Jesus gives us, who was God himself and who knew the love of the Father was the picture of the shepherd who brings the sheep back into the right place joyfully, joyfully, joyfully. This is the love of the Father for the sheep. We're going to stop here. All these coins here, I'm going to pick them up. We'll do it next week. I'm not going to leave them here. Let's close in prayer this morning. And if this message is specifically for you personally, or if it's for someone else that you know God is speaking to you about that person, let the Lord deal with your heart this morning. Lord, we come to you right now. We thank you, thank you, thank you for the story that Jesus told about the shepherd who had one missing sheep and went out at great effort at great cost, at great expense, to find one missing sheep and brought it back joyfully. That there's a place for us that we count, that we matter, that if we are away from where we are supposed to be in you, you notice, you care, and you work to bring us back to our rightful place so that we will not be lost, so that we will not stray. For you are the good shepherd who joyfully brings each sheep back into the flock. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being such a good shepherd to us. We don't deserve it. Lord, how can you value us so much? I don't understand. I don't understand, Lord. And yet you do. And yet you do. Lord, may this week, may we understand your value your valuation of each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.